Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome a very special guest uh, speaker today, Professor Jason Leach. He's responsible for quality in the health and social care system, and that includes patient safety and person-centred care. In 2019, he was awarded a CBE for his significant contribution to healthcare quality. So I'm therefore really delighted to welcome Jason here today to open our Support Workforce Learning Week. Morning, everybody. And, and thank you, Jane. It's it's nice to uh, it's nice to be here. Online is weird, isn't it? I like I like a crowd that I can see, even if you don't like me. I like it. Type in the chat where you are, which part of the country. Oh, somebody in Rothsey. Maybe we should have gone there, Airdrie. So Fiona, you're going to come up later in the conversation I'm about to have. That's great. Lots of uh, lots of spread. So quite a lot of support workers. Quite a lot of uh, admin folks. Some speech therapy there was a porter earlier i think so this is my second favorite conference and and learning week of the year my favorite is the volunteers but you are my second favorite group and the reason you're my second favorite group is fundamentally the whole the whole thing can't exist without you and i think you are uh, under appreciated but when i come to a board to visit two places that I always try and go are the laundry and the kitchens. Now on the way there, you might go to estates and facilities or the porter or get up early in the morning and do the estates walk around with, with somebody who's running it. But I honestly think the heart of our institutions, now remember this is not all of our health system because there's a lot of community care and there's a lot of people working at home and there's a lot, of, but in our big institutions, I think the core of them are the laundry and the kitchens. So there's, there's layers within uh, these support services that I think are absolutely crucial. And in COVID, when you all started sewing theatre greens and cleaning the place in, in a way that had never been done before, of course, because of this crazy virus, my point is the underlying support that goes on from, from everything that happens, and often invisible, often even in the corridors, a little bit invisible to those to those around you. And perhaps not as well rewarded as you should be, perhaps not as recognised as you should be. But I uh, I can assure you that I and many others are hugely appreciative of the work you do. From when I was a, from when I had a proper job as, as a surgeon, that right, right to now where I'm the kind of, I don't know what I am, I'm the cheerleader for the, for the service in some way. And I ended up, uh, kind of randomly here in the last few years. I, I honestly don't quite know how that happened. I'm looking at her there, you'll notice, to say, right, shut up, it's my turn. And then I would start talking and she would look at me and say, right, it's my turn now, you've been talking too much. She, they put two awfully chat. Sometimes these press conferences were an hour and a half long because we spoke too much. But I, I, I end up here from here. This is Adrian. Somebody said they were from Airdrie. So this is the bottom cross, although you don't pronounce your T's in Airdrie. So this is the bottom cross in Airdrie. Not far from where I went to school. Not far from the church I still go to. Not far from where my parents still are. The railway station in Airdrie. Uh, and it, I end up, uh, this is my dad. So he leaves school at 14. He's a coal miner from Fife. My mum's from the East End of Glasgow. So I, I my my credibility, I think, comes partly from them. He's quite excited in this picture because we're sitting outside a fish and chip shop waiting for fish and chips during COVID, and that was a that was like a pager, you know, these things that that kind of kind of goes off when your meal's ready because we weren't allowed to queue up. He's eighty two, and uh, retired as the head of engineering in a uh, further education college, and did his degree at the same time as I did mine. So I ended up here at Glasgow University and I had the privilege to go there and ended up as a graduate in the back row there with a flick very young uh, this is my dental class in 1991 I end up as a head neck surgeon in the west of Scotland mainly although I've worked in Lanarkshire worked in Forth Valley worked in Argyll and Clyde what used to be Argyll and Clyde and then ended up in America and when I went to America, I did a public health degree because I was fed up seeing the same person with the same broken jaw. And it's a bit of a cliche, but I, I was seeing the same guy who was getting beat up by the same guy month after month after month. And I was seeing the same woman 
beaten up by her husband repeatedly in a cycle. And and it I was it was a repair shop. I mean I was I wasn't terrible at it. It was fine. It was quite good fun to to get to repair broken jaws and fix people and send them out on their way and do cancer care and all that. But it but it seemed to me there was something bigger, something that was about why that street was violent or why the behavioural habits were causing people to get cancer or whatever. And I, I ended up in the States with Lynn, who's a teacher, my wife's a teacher, and she got a year off. And I uh, she lunched and went to the movies and received tourist visitors. And I worked in America for a year and a half and got a public health degree. Little did I know that public health would then become important a bit later in life when I was here again. And this is quite early on in the uh, process in 2020. It feels like a long time ago now, doesn't it? And yet somehow it feels like yesterday. I'm I'm involved just now in the public inquiry, of course, and I'm answering a thousand questions, would you believe? A thousand questions from the UK public inquiry. And it's all coming back to me because I'm having to look through my diary and look through the things we did and read the advice we gave us. It's, it's um, unbelievable what, what, we, uh, what we experienced, what you all experienced during that time. And I ended up with this job. She looked at me one day, I think to her credit, that she couldn't do all the media herself, even though she was tempted to do that. She knew that she needed a clinician to talk to the public. And that's the job I ended up with. So I wasn't the principal advisor to the cabinet or the the person who gave most of the advice. I was the translator of the advice. And then, unfortunately for you guys, I also ended up on the telly. You'd spend a whole day filming this 30, 40 second uh, clip that they would then use on the telly to try and get the message over. And I and I ended up as I imagine some of this crowd are off the ball fans. So I ended up on the radio every Saturday because there was no football because we'd cancelled all the football. So I end up doing a radio phone in show. But you could lose your job every week because they're cheeky. And they take you down, particularly Cowan on the left, who's a stand-up comedian and funny. And he he, he does double long tonga at 12 o'clock on a Saturday, and that's a disaster. So I end up in this weird world, this weird environment. And some of it was some of it was uh, very positive and good, and some of it was uh, pretty nasty. I, I've had we've had death threats, we've had envelopes with stuff in them, we've had people sending masks through the, the, with a marker pen on them saying I'm done and my secretaries had to open horrible horrible letters from people now a lot of people lost relatives some of you maybe did some of you maybe have long COVID so it's not this has not been a straightforward one linear journey it's been lots of ups and downs and um, we've had loads of people in the street come up to Lynn and I and be nice and lovely and then I've had other people just on the train the other day somebody shouting and bawling at me for I mean I just took it. I mean, I wasn't, I was trying my best, Mrs. is what I wanted to say to her. Young people come up to me and it's their granny that wants the selfie, not the young person. So young people don't know who I am, but older people do know, know who I am generally, the ones that were forced to watch us on, on the telly. So, so where, what, what have I learned then maybe about, about things, things that might help us here in, the, in this group, those, those of you who are helping run our health and care system? This is a, a, a famous quote that you, you don't really learn to be a leader unless you're in a proper crisis. And this was a this was a crisis. Many of you were in the heart of it, either in your families or in your jobs or wherever you were. E- even even if you were able to to contain yourselves in a in a laundry and just get on with your work, it was different. And you, you you had to wear PPE. You had to come in differently. You had to do different shifts. You had, people were off sick. Everybody had a different experience of this this chaos so let me let me quickly describe what i think my lessons are and we'll, we'll do this relatively quickly so we've got time for questions so my 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 three quick lessons are you've got to understand what your problem is don't don't guess what your problem is you've got to choose to lead because not everybody does that and you've got to breathe you've got to find time for your own and others well-being so that's the that's the health and well-being a lesson, and we'll we'll do them quickly at the end. But let, when I when I, what do I mean when I say understand? Well, there's a lot of nonsense talked about COVID, and all all health and care. A lot of people say it. The, the 
don't don't understand exactly what we were trying to deal with. The the way we tried to resolve that, and this is the tricky bit that people don't understand, that the public inquiry perhaps don't understand well, is we were trying to deal with four things at once. And when you truly understand COVID and the response, you end up in this slightly odd place. So harm number one, top left, COVID. It, it's it's the actual harm from COVID, the, the disease. Now, that's pretty easy to understand. It's horrid, but you know how many people die. You know how many people get the infection. Top right is then what you do causes other harm. So the health and social care service is harmed by your response. So many of you have probably been on a waiting list and the waiting lists are longer because of what we did with COVID. We moved people away from screening, for instance, and we moved them over here. So screening was behind and we, we took people out of theatre and put them into intensive care. So theatres couldn't see as many people. Then it gets even more complicated because harm number three is social harm. The, the harm that we caused with loneliness, with lack of education, with kids being educated at home, with old folks' day centres being closed. To protect them from harm number one, remember, I mean, we didn't, we didn't want to do that, but in order to protect them from harm number one, we cause harm number three. So now it's got much more complicated. Do you want to be in the First Minister's seat now when she's making these choices? I don't. It's terrible. Harm number four is then economic harm. So what you're trying to do financially, so losing jobs, the people who drove our Ubers, the people who owned the cafes, the people who delivered our Amazon parcels. That, so what does it do when you shut down your society in some way? We were all still working, but what did it do to people who lost their jobs or lost their business? I, met a, I got vaccinated this week and I, I met a lady who was absolutely lovely at the front door and she was so pleased to see me and she was taking pictures and all that. And she said, my daughter's not such a fan. And I thought, oh, here we go. What, what's this? And she said, she owned a soft play. I said, well, that, she's right not to be a fan because we closed her down for two and a half years. They were, the, they were the first to shut and the last to open. Now, you could argue soft play is still filthy and you shouldn't be allowed in the ball pit ever. But you get my point. So, so people in that economic harm box, joking aside, that was, that was real harm. And that was harm four. So we tried to deal with it. So let me just illustrate them a little. So this is harm number one. This is Westview, Westview in Shetland. And there's, there's some Shetland people on here who might know this care home. It's a care home about 40 miles from Lerwick and uh, 40 minutes from Lerwick. So, so it's, it's inland a bit. Now, nothing's very far in Shetland, but it's windy, single track roads. and It's in the middle of nowhere. That's all you need to know. And seven people died here in, in the first few months of, the, of wave one. So before we knew what we were dealing with, before it had a proper name, before we had any treatment, you remember Northern Italy, where most of the harm was in the early stages. Well, somebody came from Northern Italy on holiday, skiing, ended up in Shetland and the virus spread. I mean, it's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't take a genius to work it out. But we didn't know what it was doing and what it was causing. And, we, and last UK home was one of our first sites and they lost seven residents. I went to visit. I've been here. I've met the families. I've met the staff. I've spent time with them. And the stories are unbelievable. The, the, it, the cleaner who had gone every day to her work, she, she lives a bus ride away from Westview and the bus wouldn't stop to pick her up because everybody was scared of what, what this virus was. The shop in the town, which is, remember, 40 minutes from the next shop, wouldn't serve anybody who worked in the care home. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's like a novel. It's like fiction. Once this care home knew what this disease was, and we, we understood it and gave advice and helped everybody, no other deaths, not a single death the whole way through the pandemic following this early outbreak. So you can you can do it. It's just hard. It's really hard, particularly in the early stages. So that's harm number one. It's a horror story of harm number one. Harm number two, of course, is one that you all know very well. It's the emergency vehicles piled up at the A&E. 
this I think this is Wishaw. Uh, and and people waiting too long for GP appointments and not able to get through and get a dentist and all that. And that's harm number two. Harm number three is education, loneliness, all the things that we caused with our shutdown. And then harm number four is the difference between this in Edinburgh's grass market. So this is a normal spring day in Edinburgh with drinks and afternoon tea and pubs and clubs and, and then this. I mean, you, you, ca you, can't, you can't go from that to that without economic harm. I mean, somebody owns that pub and somebody employs people in that pub. And the, the, the people who come as tourists, who stay in the hotels, who go to the theatre, who buy the iron brew and the chemist, whatever. So, so that has an effect on your society. Of, of course it does. Now, some of that was mitigated with furlough, with grants, with, but that, that in itself causes economic harm because you then have to pay that. You, money doesn't grow on trees, unfortunately. So that, that somewhere, that has to come from somewhere. And over time, you, 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 pay that, you pay that debt back. And part of the cost of living crisis we've had, part of it, is almost certainly because of the money we had to spend in every country, in most countries in the world who had to try and recover. So my first lesson is the, the, the problems are usually more complicated than they look, I'm afraid. So understand your problem is my first, is my first lesson. My second lesson is uh, lead. Step, step up. Nobody else is going to do this for you. So this is, this is Hamza Yusuf, who's now the first minister, who was the health secretary. And imagine the conversation when, he, when Jean Freeman says she's not going to stand in the election in 2021. And uh, so she's been the health secretary for the first year of the pandemic. And then in May 21, there's another election. And uh, <laughs> Hamza goes in to see the first minister. And she says, uh, oh, I'd like you to be the health secretary during the pandemic. So he takes it. He takes it. And uh, then you can you you know what's happened since well, she's left. He's he's come in. He's now the first minister. But this was my first visit with him around a hospital in Monklands. And it's to remind me to tell you a story, not about him, but about this visit. And it's about leadership and stepping up. I, uh, I was in infectious diseases which is a big ward in, in Monkman's Hospital, a ward I know well. I know the hospital really well. And uh, I was going to different appointments that day inside the hospital. So there was a young lady assigned to help me, and she was a support worker. She was a, she was a, a healthcare assistant inside infectious diseases. So she was a healthcare assistant and taking me around, you have to go here, you have to go here. So, and we were, we were on our way to the canteen where I was to speak to all of the staff. And she was telling me the horror of how it had been during the first wave. And they'd had 19 deaths a week in the first wave of the pandemic, 19 a week. And she had worked in infectious diseases for three years prior to the pandemic and not seen anybody die, not seen any death, because we're really good at infectious disease in the modern world. We, we, we can fix it. But then she was telling me these stories of iPads and people holding hands and couldn't be with each other. Terrible, just terrible. And she was crying. It was really misery. And I said, so what, what's your plan? Are you going to go to Aldi's and Airdrie and get another job for more money? Because this is misery. You can't keep doing this. It's going to kill you. And she said, no, 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 I'm going to be a nurse. I said, what? And she said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a nurse. I've applied to the Open University and I've just been accepted. So I... I thought it was an inspiring story of, of leadership and, and really, really stepping up. Because she'd seen nurses during this chaos and she decided that she wanted to be part of that tribe and help. I don't know what's happened to her. I keep meaning to go back and see if she's stuck with it and see if she's still there. I really, really hope she has. And that, that's leadership. That, that's, that's stepping up. As was, of course, her healthcare assistant role when she was in that ward every single day during wave one. And it, it maybe felt a bit like this donkey when in your job. I don't know, I don't know what you did during this period, or if you had three kids at home you were trying to educate, or a granny you were trying to visit, or and your job as a porter or in the laundry or in speech therapy, what whatever you were trying to do. But it maybe my days sometimes felt a bit like this. You you get imposter syndrome where you think, how did I end up here? And I had that pretty much every day 
when I was on, when I was standing at that podium with the leader of the country, whatever you think of her, uh, but she she was at the time the leader of the country. You look across and you think, how did I end up here? I've got the chief constable, the first minister, and a wee guy for Airdrie trying to trying to tell the country how to behave. But there aren't there isn't a special room of of clever people. There isn't there aren't there aren't uh, cavalry isn't coming over the hill. So so my second lesson is to lead. Now that might just be in the bit you're in, because that's the bit you've got some control over, or it or it might be more broad than that. And my second, my third rather quick lesson is to breathe, is to take time for yourself, your family, for those around you, those who work for you, those who work with you, because everybody's knackered and it was hard. And I'm not sure we fully appreciated quite how hard it was. I'm having the weirdest experience reading over the re inquiry stuff. So, so lo looking back over it is almost bringing back the trauma because at the time you're just running so fast that you just get through it. But actually teachers, supermarket workers, key workers that we had are, are struggling. And some of you will be in that, in that environment. Nays and others have lots of support available for that. There's loads of places you can do that. When we built the Louisa Jordan, the loads of people gave us free stuff at the SEC. So we had the Nightingale hospitals in England and Wales, and then we had the Louisa Jordan in Scotland. And Lint gave us more Lint bunnies than you've ever seen in your life. I mean, thousands of the damn things. And free juice, and a guy came and did cappuccinos, and the boy on the left did a Zoom fitness class every morning. It was great. It was great. I mean, I'll take a Lint bunny. I mean, I'll take free stuff. But let's not pretend that's actual well-being. That, that, that's not what we mean. We mean decent wages, time with your kids, leaving when the shift's finished, job security, a decent team to work with. I'll, you can give me a Lint Bunny as well. I mean, the Lint Bunny's, what, I'll have it and I'll take your free cappuccino. I, get, I showed this image at, at, a, at an event a wee while ago and uh, a fella, a kind of gnarly orthopedic surgeon at the back of the room put his hand up and I thought, right, here we go. And he said, uh, that's all very well. I was at the Queen Elizabeth and nobody came with lint bunnies at the Queen Elizabeth. And he's right, of course. So the Louisa Jordan, because it was shiny and new and it was important and it was great. And lots of people worked really hard there. But the Queen Elizabeth, four miles along the river, they didn't get any lint bunnies. They just had to work harder. So there is, there is though, uh, some work on, on what well-being actually is. And we don't, we don't have time to do it in detail. This is one model and NEDS have a version of this and others in the boards and local authorities have versions. This is the organization I worked for in the States when I was there, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, who helped run our safety work in Scotland for many years. This is the, they call it, they're American, remember, they call it joy in work. Now, I'm not sure we're ever going to get joy in work to catch on in Scotland, frankly, but but this is, it, it's quite, the, the, the theory is still quite good and there's a lot you can read, there's a white paper that uh, somebody could maybe even find it online and put the link in the put the link in the box. It's the joy and work white white paper from from IHI. But they talk about being engaged. They talk about Im improving and change. So being involved in something that makes it better. They talk even about uh, going for lunch together and and time to eat together or away days together. And, and they talk about empowerment. So where you are allowed to make choice, where it's not done to you, it's done with you, rather than just, just having to take all the guidance that others are writing. So it's, it makes perfect sense. And it's the, it's thank you, Laura. That's the, uh, that's the IHI white paper. So, so trying to do all of that in terms, and there's lots of ways of, of doing precisely that. So my, my final lesson tries to bring all of them together. And it's a story, I'm gonna go back to my dad. And De Deming talked about that joy and work. That's where they got the phrase from. So my dad uh, gives g is is very very generous with advice. Okay, and that's not always good, and his stories are mostly made up. But this one has less than I think. So one of the problems here is the thing is overwhelming. 
so 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 the the challenges are are over everywhere you look there's too there's too much to do i mean it's covid was one example of that but now it feels like the waiting lists are too long it feels like it's too hard winter's coming all that so what what do, what do you do well this is this is my my dad's advice to me and therefore to you so golf invented in scotland run in st andrews so every year in st andrews the committee writes down the rules of golf right and they make up the rules of golf 2023 2024 and they send those rules out to the whole golfing community around the world so everybody plays with the same clubs and the ball's got to be this size and you're allowed this many shots and the, right so the general rules of golf are set in st andrews and they are the same everywhere in the world when you go to a golf course you are given or they're on the wall your local rules so those local rules might be, well, there's an oak tree on the left of the first. And if you hit the oak tree and it goes here, the ball's out about. Now, St. Andrews can't know all that. Of course not. So everybody has local rules. Got it? Bombay Golf Club. This is Bombay Golf Club. Bombay Golf Club has a problem that doesn't appear in the St. Andrews rule book. And it is monkeys on the course. Now, if you have monkeys on your golf course, you better know what to do. So if the monkey steals the ball and runs away, that, that might be good. It might run towards a hole. But if the monkey takes your ball up a tree, what the heck are you going to do now? Well, that's a disaster. So rule eight at the Bombay Golf Club is play the ball where the monkey drops it. Play the ball where the monkey drops it. You got my metaphor, my lesson? So you can't you can't manage the whole health service. It's impossible. So don't complain about other people. It's not. It's just energy sapping. You're just going to get frustrated. It's going to kill you. So your your circle of control, your laundry, your ward, your GP practice, your patients, your next blanket to fold. I I don't care what it is. Your piece of the puzzle. That's the only bit you can change and improve and make better. So my dad's advice was always play the ball where the monkey drops it. You've been given that bit of power, so take that bit of power. Now, over time, you might end up in a leadership role. You might end up with a group of pals who want to change something bigger. Yeah, that's great. But don't complain about three layers above and two layers below because it, 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 will, it won't fix anything. Mrs. Leach, you can imagine when she comes to the dining room table after a day's teaching, quite quite likes to complain about the management. And uh, I'm like, honey, what, what, what's your plan? What's your plan? So I have to listen a wee bit because I've learned that. But actually, you can't, you can't, you can't fix that. Just as we finish, my actual final advice is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with 1980s uh, science fiction movies, but if you, if you ever get in Doc's car, and he asks you to turn the dial to the year you want to go back to the future to. Uh, don't choose 2020 because it was grim. Do not, do not go there. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that uh, wasn't too dull for first thing on a Monday morning. I can't believe anybody's even here at this time in the morning. So, Jason, that was fab. Thank you so much.